Hey everybody, welcome to the Thanksgiving edition of the PC Perspective mail bag or what have you. Uh, quick note, my daughter is here with me at the office, so if she suddenly walks up behind me, there will be a short 30 second delay in the mailbag's continuance. Uh, if you have a question for me, leave it in the comments of this video below or in the comments on PCPer.com. Uh, we have a good list to go through here. Let's get started. Mike Hartman asks, a few podcasts ago, you were talking about how phones these days are octa-core, but a certain number of cores are reserved for system tasks and not available on the API level. Do you think PCs, specifically laptops, with ever-increasing core counts will be like this? Would there be any efficiency gains? Um, well, first of all, I don't remember this specific conversation. Um, <clears throat> I know that you know, different systems are going to treat uh, on mobile devices. Different systems are going to treat these cores very differently. You know, the the app, the Apple uh, A10 and A10X, for example, uh, an application can only access the big cores with little cores, not both simultaneously. With the A11, um, that has changed. They can now access all the six cores on there. Um, you know, the, it's up to the operating system at that point you know, whether it be Android or iOS, to balance big core, little core. And actually, as we see Snapdragon on Windows devices kind of come out into fruition, you'll see um, Windows have to know and how to balance little core, big core. Now, in, term, <clears throat> in terms of PCs, do I see laptops with much higher core counts um, kind of shifting to something where certain cores are are relegated to OS level tasks only. I mean, maybe. Um, will there be efficiency gains for that? I don't think necessarily. I think that the, the threading capability uh, of these operating systems is fairly efficient at this point. They're getting better all the time, obviously, but they're fairly efficient. They know how to keep threads that should be on the same core or on the same die doing that so that they're sharing memory uh, efficiently. Um, there could be some advantages to that, advantages to that, but I feel like that's a pretty far future item where we have way more than eight cores on on a system. Uh, you know, maybe we're getting into a big little design from something like Intel eventually at some point as well. Uh, but I, I think it's I think it's an interesting idea that you always have two cores that can do these these background CPU tasks. They're not affecting your foreground activity, uh, but it will still, you know, they're still going to have to use power. They're still going to have to use uh, electric and juice. So that will affect battery life and affect efficiency and cooling capability and whatnot. Next question from Nebu Thomas. Why is super sampling so demanding in games? Um, super sampling is demanding in games because it is a, a brute force method of improving image quality. It basically renders the image at a multiple resolution than it's what you're displaying it at. So right, if you have a super sample uh, and on a 1080p image of 2x, you're rendering twice as many pixels. If you have it at 4x, four times as many. So that's why you're getting such a, a GPU um, re re reduction in GPU performance is because it's rendering many times the pixels uh, and then it super and then it kind of samples it back down to your resolution. So you get the the improvement in image quality, which is universal across all, you know, all pixels, all shapes, all triangles, whatever. Uh, but it is very dependent or very heavy on your on your GPU. Multi sampling, for example, only renders in specific locations and only looks for areas that aren't covered by triangles, et cetera, et cetera. So it does some efficiency stuff for that. Here's here's that first uh, delay, guys. Yes. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so there you go. That explains super sampling demanding in games. Beatwolf44 wants to know, do you think GPUs will ever replace the role of CPUs? Uh, mm, no, uh, hmm. no, probably not. Um, the GPUs are still really bad at branching uh, code, right? Which is what CPUs are, are very good at. Out of order designs, non-super parallel designs. I think we may get to a point where GPUs are fast enough at that code and, and in some operating systems and some environments that code is low uh, value enough that GPUs will just be able to run it and we'll move on, right? Uh, where like something like the branching portion of a high performance compute server side enterprise application is so um, so infrequent that the impact of the GPU uh, being bad at it will be negligible compared to the cost 
of integrating it or the power efficiency of integrating a CPU or whatever it happens to be. So I don't think they'll ever replace CPUs um, necessarily, but uh, I, I could see a, some, some select instances where they could take the role because it doesn't matter that much. Lambda Ghost wants to know, with AMD making both CPUs and GPUs and Intel about to do the same, do you think NVIDIA will ever start making CPUs as well in order to compete? Um, no, no. Well, they, I mean, they kind of already did this, right? They did this with Denver, Project Denver. They made their own ARM-based processor um, that is, you know, kind of not used anymore. It's, you know, it, this is what became Tegra. This is the things that were in smartphones. It's in Shield. Um, you know, what's in Tegra is kind of more of a off-the-shelf ARM design as opposed to a custom ARM design like Denver is. You know, I could see um, them continuing down that pathway a little bit, although they have backed off from it slightly already. Uh, it's it's not an easy task. Uh, and my guess is that if you look at the talent, uh, the pool of talent at Apple that is de developing custom ARM cores, it is significant, and it's a significant investment. And I think NVIDIA and uh, its CEO are quite happy with the push they're making on the GPU side. And if they want to, you know let Intel and AMD battle it out for this very low margin CPU space comparative to like GPU space, then I think they're going to be more than willing to, uh, to let that happen. Zip Zio Lock asks, why do so many manufacturers of, of Android based devices stop releasing updates? For example, Asus and the Nexus 7. I don't feel safe using my Nexus 7 because it's missing the latest security updates. Is this an intentional strategy to force me to buy a new device? Or is there some technical reason? Um, despite the conspiracy theories, I don't really think there's an intentional strategy to force you to buy a new device. I think it's a happy coincidence with the fact that um, continuing device support is expensive. Uh, it requires a lot of resources to do. And there's a significant uh, lack of return on that investment. Right, so the Nexus Seven, for example, has been out for many years. They're not selling it anymore. Um, to continue to support it is going to cost them, you know, X millions of dollars a year. Uh, but they're not selling any units, and if anything, they're losing money as RMAs continue up and all that type of stuff. Right, so um, I think the forced upgrade cycle is is kind of a, of a myth, but it is the result of an unfortunate software ecosystem that surrounds the Android device market right that's just kind of the way it works it stinks um you know, would like to see guys like samsung uh lg kind of the big android players really come up with a plan of integration long term i mean even google doesn't really i mean google with their pixel devices does a pretty good job with that but it's such a small portion of the android market that it's kind of not really worth bringing up almost at this point, right? If you want long-term OS support, the Pixel devices are the way to go, but it definitely limits your selection. But if you like long-term software support on iOS, you also have a very limited hardware selection. So it kind of goes hand in hand, perhaps. The uh, Inabrati, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that one again, to what extent does enabling HDR reduce performance? Um, I did some looking on this. In general, the enabling of HDR in games should have a negligible impact on gaming performance, right? Um, you, the, the game engines are already doing tone mapping as kind of like their last step before they output to Windows and, and to DirectX and whatnot. So now they're just kind of tone mapping slightly differently to a wider color space. So in theory, there should not be any dramatic changes to performance. You know, I've seen claims from developers say 1% to 2%, um, which is good news, right? So I don't think that we have a lot to worry about in terms of HDR integration and performance that way. Stree Guru wants to know, would it be possible to have GPUs in the M.2 form factor? Um, technically, yeah. I mean, you could probably do that, right? You're currently limited to a PCIe by 4 implementation, so that's a little bit limiting for high-resolution um, textures and stuff that stream from from main system memory to the GPU or what have you. Uh, electrically, obviously, there's not 75 watts coming through the M.2 slot, so you'd have to have external power still. Um, GPUs aren't that small. 
cooling is going to be a concern. There's weight issues. There, I mean, electrically, you could you could do this. Um, I just don't think it makes a whole lot of sense. Now, maybe if we, you know, if you're looking at, we get down to the point where, uh, you know, an MX150 or something like that from NVIDIA is 20 watts. And you can put it in M.2 design, and it has a little tiny active fan that's also not super high-pitched and annoying. Um, and it just takes a single Molex power connector or a six-pin power connector or something like that. It might be interesting to see something like that. Um, but I, I think instead what we'll probably see happen is improvements in the integrated graphics portion of AMD and Intel processors instead rather than go down that, go down that route. So an interesting thought, uh, and not impossible, but not really a good idea, I think. Matt Chris, uh, Christians wants to know, I'm curious, do any of the PC per crew play with the Raspberry Pi for things like holiday light displays or something similar? Um, I asked around real quickly and nobody said they did that. No, we use Raspberry Pis for some odd things and we've done some experiments here. Um, the TV behind me during the podcast, for example, is powered by a Raspberry Pi uh, and it switches the background image based on the show we're doing right really simple use of what it is um, it's got a script that's supposed to determine what day it is so when it gets powered on it knows what background it puts on behind it those types of things we've used raspberry pis for some of our uh, testing like uh, when we do latency testing on displays for example we can use them for that uh, i know tom peterson from nvidia he uses a raspberry pi to control his lights and sprinkler system at his house that he built custom software to do and it's funny because he told me that sometimes if the timing script he wrote doesn't work right he has to log into a shell script in order to turn off the lights to the outside of his house because there's no physical switch to really do it without resetting everything on there so um no we don't use anything like the raspberry pi for holiday lights i just I think it's a really cool idea, and every time I drive around and I see people who have, uh, we go to some of these houses in our area that have tons of lights, and they're all timed to music, and they have FM broadcasters, and uh, it all sounds really cool. I just don't have the time or patience, mostly, to do that kind of stuff. It's really neat, though. Antonio Cunningham wants to know, is there a story behind the origami that sits on top of the TV during podcasts? Uh, yeah, but it's not an incredibly exciting story. It is um, when we did our review for the Intel Coffee Lake processor, and we did that video, uh, Alex decided we needed a good thumbnail, so we had coffee grounds in the office, hence Coffee Lake, and then uh, he built an origami boat and put it on the coffee grounds for the picture that we use in the thumbnail. And then rather than throw away an excellent piece of art like that, I believe he taped it to the TV behind us. It's not just floating there, right? It's, it's there. Oh, it's just sitting there? Well, I'm impressed. Impressed. I thought it was taped or glued or something. Uh, so that's why it exists. It was a prop for the Coffee Lake review. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Daniel Monsanto asks, we're getting into our holiday questions now, what kinds of unique alcohol have you tried anything special or from a certain country that left an impression good or bad um there was one time i was in oakland which is like a foreign country to me uh and uh the bartender offered me and a buddy liquor that was in a jug like a clay ceramic jug uh, and I mistakenly said yes, and we drank it, and I was incredibly sick the rest of the night. Um, it was just clear white dog style, you know, booze, pure grain alcohol. It was really bad. I don't recommend that. So that definitely had that definitely left an impression. Um, the other one that I could think of that left an impression. Other, I drink a lot of bourbon. Let me rephrase that. I drink bourbon sometimes. I'm not a, I'm not a drunk all the time. I, I've got bourbon here at the office, but anyway. Um, I do like bourbon, um, and there's all kinds of stuff. We could have a whole different conversation about that. The other, the only other alcohol that stood out in my mind is ouzo, I believe it's pronounced. It's Greek, and it's clear, and it tastes like black licorice. So if you like that, that's great. I'm not a fan of black licorice, um, so it's not great, but it definitely uh, has a lot of appeal to a lot of people. I think it's ouzo, E-O-U-Z-E. I don't remember. I don't know how it's pronounced or how it's spelled either. So, uh, that's that's all I got for the alcohol stuff. I don't. 
I don't drink fancy wines. I don't, you know, it, beers, beers and bourbons, I guess is what I'm, what I'm good for here. Michael Thierer asks Turkey or ham for Thanksgiving. I mean, this isn't, this isn't really a question, right? It's obviously the answer is Turkey and Easter is ham. Um, Christmas is also ham. Yeah, Christmas is also ham, Ken points out. It, you can have both at Thanksgiving. You can have turkey and ham, but you have to have turkey. Um, I mean, you have to have it. I don't, I mean, that's all there is to it. It's the best. It's also the best for the next day leftover sandwiches. Um, and the next day after that, leftover sandwiches. And like leftover turkey Thanksgiving is almost as good as same day turkey Thanksgiving, sweet potato casserole, green bean casserole, mashed potatoes, all that good stuff. So uh, the answer is turkey uh, and ham. And whatever else you want to put in there, I guess. So, uh, sorry guys, that was way shorter than I thought it was going to be. Um, but uh, that's all the questions we had lined up for this episode. It is going to be a holiday, so hey, everybody's taking a little bit of a break here. If you have questions for us, we'll be back next week with another episode as well. Uh, leave them in the comments here on this YouTube video. Leave them on the comments on PCPer.com. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out, um, and hope everybody who is celebrating it at least has uh, an awesome holiday weekend. Thanks, guys. Thank you.